Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Cost Control, Lecture 4B. So in this lecture, we're going to be following up on what we discussed in Lecture 4A, which was the direct method of what I call an anatomy of a recovery. How do we recover a project? How do we update a project? How do we recover a project? And what are some of the elements that you require for baseline cost control, for baseline schedule control, the inputs, and then the ability to compare it. So we'll round out today's lecture with a little bit about uh, the requirements for cost control and the variety of uh, ways and means of measuring cost control. And so uh, we've been stressing all along the importance of measuring and cost monitoring and control. And we'll be looking at this from a macro view. So if you haven't seen lecture 4A, make sure you go back and you uh, review uh, 4A uh, so that you can see the individual granular view because you need both views. Uh, as I've probably mentioned before in other lectures, uh, the interrelationship that goes on with the site team between like a site superintendent and a project manager, they kind of cross over each other. A site superintendent takes to, tends to take a shorter view a project manager take, tends to take a longer view. And you know what? Both are important, right? Like you got to deal with what's coming up in the next six weeks, like a site superintendent would. And you got to deal with, as a project manager, you're going to be turning over this project to the client on time. Maybe you have various phases where you're going to turn things over. So you're going to be taking a longer view. But they cross over each other and the communication has to lap over. And one, the overall project has a budget, but also individual items have a budget. And how are we doing on those individual items? And do we have to do some course corrections along the way? So I think this section will give you a better understanding at a high level view what we're trying to do. Because I think a lot of people don't stop and smell the roses, so to speak, and really fully grasp um, why they're doing things on a day-to-day -day basis so it better interacts with the high level view of what's required. So we'll be crisscrossing that um, with this section here. And I'm gonna be sort of using a metaphoric example of what uh, is termed wayfinding to describe it as best I can, because I find that's a pretty good metaphorical way to um, look at this whole process. So let's get into it, let's jump into it. So. Have you ever heard of uh, the term wayfinding? And um, it, it goes under different terms, like there's an architectural term for wayfinding, you know, how people actually move around a property or a, a college campus or that sort of thing or a city. Um, but really the term I'm talking about is going back to um, hundreds of years uh, to um, early Polynesians who actually populated most of the islands in the Pacific Ocean. And these islands, they're thousands of miles apart. You know, the Hawaiian Islands were populated these ways. You know, much of Indonesia was populated this way. And so these wayfinders, they actually um, developed a craft. And I was watching a documentary a few years ago uh, that was, um, it was actually on a podcast. Well, I've seen a documentary on a podcast. The podcast was Defining Mastery, and it was um, this example of uh, wayfinders that um, were able to find an island and be able to repeat their journey, their trips back and forth from one island to another, thousands of miles apart, uh, reasonably, reliably, and they didn't have a GPS, they didn't even have a compass. What they had to rely on was the stars, they had to understand the wind currents, they had to be able to set their provisions in the right way, and they really had to develop this craft. So they had a certain goal of where they wanted to go, and they developed uh, that goal, and then they developed all the processes, systems of getting ready for it so that they could do it in a repeatable fashion. If you've been uh, following the lectures up to this point, you can sort of see a pattern between goals, processes, and systems, and being successful in project management. And indeed, we need to do that in cost control so that we can ensure that we can keep on track in our projects, just like a wayfinder 
would have to keep on track on their journey to another island. So they really had to master the craft of wayfinding. So, you know, they didn't even have real sails. Like it was basically a flat bottom uh, canoe that they would use uh, that was fairly large and they would have to set the provisions and they would have to um, really adjust uh, to, like I said, the waves, the stars, the wind, their speed, the weather. Uh, they'd have to have a, a well-trained crew. And there was many other things that had to come together for them to be successful. You know what? If they weren't successful, uh, you never heard from them again because the ship was lost at sea and that was the end of them. Um, so to be able to do that, uh, because they know this because the same language is spoken on a lot of these interspersed islands in the Pacific. And that's one of the ways that they um, know how this was done. Uh, and there's some that still have that craft today. And so when I was watching this, I was thinking, you know what, this is really project management because we have to, as project managers in a construction industry, and to be honest, in most industries, um, we have to understand our clients' requirements and priorities. So we really got to understand what they value, what's the scope we're responsible for, uh, what are the schedule requirements that we're driving for, so that baseline development of a schedule, change order impacts, which we'll be looking at later in this course and understanding when we insert a change, what does that do to everything else, cost, time, etc. Uh, productivity rates, you know, what are we producing in a certain rate of time? Uh, how many blocks per hour? How many cubic meters of concrete is being poured? How many square meters of formwork is going up per hour? Productivity rates and monitoring that. Budgets we've discussed, going from an estimate to a budget and finding a way to be able to track it in a work breakdown structure. Uh, meeting all the regulatory requirements. If we don't, that means it's going to be delay the project. We're going to have to do rework. That's going to cost more money. Setting up the site so that it's as productive as possible. And then when we have unexpected events, being able to correspondingly adjust for that. Test and commissioning, making sure that we have a realistic time frame, that we understand how it impacts the other parts of the work that we have assigned an appropriate budget to do that work. Uh, weather, as my, I took this picture uh, photo this morning, I'm up in Collingwood and uh, this is the shipyards and I was going for my six o'clock morning walk. This was near the end because it started to get bright. Uh, and you know, it snowed a lot up here and there's weather conditions when you're under construction. There's probably about uh, two and a half feet of snow up on the flat roof up here where there's balconies and all of this work with the siding and everything going on. Um, this is what you got to deal with, right? Uh, it's different if it's, you know, uh, 20 degrees Celsius and uh, nice and sunny and not too much wind, but you have all of these conditions that you have to deal with. And you can bet this costs money. This interrupts the flow of work. This has issues with it. Uh, so we talked about contingencies in the first uh, lecture, uh, having a contingency reserve for uh, basically the known uh, unknowns. Well, this would be a known unknown. There's no way you plan a project like this and know that you're going to go through the winter and not expect some snow. So that would be a known unknown. Now, you know what, if it kept snowing for the next two weeks and we get like uh, five or six feet of snow, then we're getting into probably a... Uh, management reserve contingency where we've got a little bit extra put aside for the extra uh, disturbance that this is going to cause right and that's more in the unknown unknowns that we talked about you have to ensure uh, excellent communication between all parties we have to engage with the people involved in the project and if we're not doing that well you know what we're not utilizing the talent on the project so that would be uh, number eight in lean uh, waste areas, uh, which would be underutilized talent. Uh, really understand your team, their strengths, their weaknesses, uh, making sure that everybody is collaborating properly and correctly, everybody knows their responsibilities, and driving and engaging and motivating towards that project closeout. So these are all like a wayfinder, you know, if you want to get to your destination island, you've got to be doing these things and you got to be doing them well. And if you're off on one of them, it could sink you. Uh, this, you got to be doing all of these. If you're not doing them well, it could sink you. Um, so really, uh, we want to think about uh, that the project plan 
it's iterative, it changes, it's not static, it's dynamic. Uh, and uh, keep that in mind and that's fine. But we do need to have some attunement to where we are, right? Where are we going and where are we right now compared to where we should be? How do we compare? Very important in the area of project management. That's why we spend so much time on scheduling, so much time on cost control is because we really uh, have to be able to measure where we are. It's the same way a wayfinder needs to know on a map, where are they? So when you think about that, our baseline cost budget and our baseline schedule is really going to give us the map to where we want to go. And then we got to figure the coordinates at any time in during our journey where we are so we can do our course corrections. So I think about it this way. Uh, if you want to sort of envision it, uh, what I was um, basically saying. Um, so you have the home island. So the Wayfinder has the home island and then there's the destination island. So there's the home island and there's the destination island, where they want to go. We have our project, our vision, our goal, our contract, our mental model for the development, how we want to get there. We have our set of drawings. We have our um, specifications that's spelling out what we need to do and that helps us to develop a plan which is our baseline and if we use a cost loaded schedule then we can actually develop both com develop and combine both time and cost uh, so then what happens is we should actually have a very clear view of understanding of what we're trying to complete and that's the leadership side. That's the soft skills. We should really be able to communicate that where we're trying to get to. So that's crystallized in people's minds. And then we start off on the journey. And you know what? Things don't always go the way we planned. Uh, maybe a subcontractor goes bankrupt. Maybe we have some big snowstorms like I was just illustrating. And we get a little bit thrown off course, just like the Wayfinders. They hit a little bit of a, uh, of a tropical storm and it pushes them off course. Well, they got to figure out how far off course they are. They've got to look at the stars. They've got to understand the currents where it's taking them. And they've got to understand where in the ocean are they? We've got to understand where are we on this project compared to time and budgets. We'll be looking at short-term schedules in a few weeks. And that also plays into our better understanding our coordinates and also better understanding in doing uh, course corrections. So this is really our update. This is our first update. So in lecture 4A, if you haven't seen 4A yet, go back and look at that because then I go through the update process. This is what's going to tell you where you are during that update process. Then that's going to help you to figure out how you're going to recover time and money. So that's the recovery. That's the six steps of the direct method, the recovery stage. And you know what? That's what construction projects, that's what all projects are. They're repetition of this process. You keep updating, you keep recovering, iterating. You don't have to recover if everything went well. Like if everything went well the last month, there's nothing to recover. Or if you're a little bit of a head, you've built yourself a little bit of a buffer in there, which is always nice. But if you go off course, that's where the recovery comes in. It's all part of that process, that six step process that we talked about when we said the direct method, detect along the critical path, look sooner rather than later, the immediate, right? Reduce, so that would be the no or low cost solution. Experiment, try different paths, different possible solutions, validate them, Get commitment, the C, get commitment from the people involved in it. And you do all that, then it's going to be working well with the team and you're going to get to your destination. That's basically the, the, the idea uh, behind this process, completion of the project. You can do that. Uh, some, some construction projects, they don't do it that well. Some companies don't have the systems built in. We talked about systems, habits, routines, rituals creating a positive culture, that's the T in the team. And they don't do that that often. So what happens is they tend to go off course, but they don't really know where they are. And it gets worse and it gets worse. And before long, you're kind of like the different ocean, the Titanic in the Atlantic, and you hit an iceberg and the project kind of sinks. Uh, so to avoid that, we need to be doing these processes that we're talking about, developing a plan and a schedule and 
a budget for the project and then carefully monitoring it as time goes by on the project and seeing how our costs are comparing to the time compared to the physical work that is completed and then knowing how far outside that path we are. So I think about it in those terms. Um, also, when we think about uh, success in project management, we think about all the changes. So we go back to lecture 1A when we talked about change uh, in the construction industry and change in our world to, for that matter. Uh, when we look at some of the new innovations that are coming in construction, and there are a lot, uh, more than there's been in a long period of time. So we're at kind of a tipping point with uh, the movement on building information modeling, with the movement on uh, basically uh, um, 3D printing and um, a lean construction methodologies. There's a lot of things that are evolving and changing the way we do things. Sustainable building practices and the technologies that are coming uh, afoot in the the technologies that are going to come about in the next even four years with some of the investments that are being made in the United States in that area, I think we're going to see a lot of um, advancement in the short term. And so these technologies really, when they're the successful ones, are really about minimizing the variation. All right. So they're about minimizing the variation from the plan. I've been discussing, you know, VUCA, you know, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. Uh, by now, you should be knowing it pretty well uh, in the earlier lectures. If we, we have a fair bit in construction, but anything that we can do that helps to reduce the variability, increase the certainty, um, get rid of some of the fog of an ambiguity is going to be helpful. And so they tend to squeeze the deviations for us when we increase our management processes and improve upon them. So this is all leading us down towards that sort of path of being more successful in our project management practices. And that, of course, includes the engagement of the best people in our projects and making sure that they're engaged and motivated towards the same overarching goals so that our systems will make us reach those goals more easily. Um, I think of, uh, I was reading a, a book recently and um, there's this term, wisdom of the crowds. And you gotta be kind of careful, you can, you can Google it, but you gotta be a little bit careful and mindful of some things. Uh, I'm always mindful of even some of the tools that I tell you, I'll, I'll always tell you, uh, think about them, but see if they're appropriate for this particular instance. Nothing works in all cases. So you always have to have a, give yourself a little bit of an open mind and a little bit of latitude with it. But wisdom of the crowds makes a lot of sense when you think about um, a crowd of skilled people in a specific area. So if we have a group, of, we have a contractor and we've got a group of subcontractors that are collaborating and working on a project, if we're trying to make certain decisions and we're really engaging that group, it's better than if just I think what's the best way. Even if I'm really experienced, I can filter that information and somebody will say something that I didn't realize and that's going to improve the plan. And that little bit of an idea culminating, going into this overall plan, it's almost like compound interest. It starts to accelerate in the learning and success on the project. Um, so in that case, wisdom of the crowd is very good. If you kind of have a, an uneducated group and everybody's following a lemming off a cliff, in that case, the wisdom of the crowds don't, doesn't work too well. So that's where I, I kind of qualify that you want to have some uh, very solid people that you're engaging with and that you've hired on your project. And then that's going to accelerate uh, the opportunities for this project to be more successful especially if we've created a collaborative uh, culture and environment as opposed to a adversarial one. So that's the um, wayfinding um, point and I'll just click this to try and get it going. Yeah. So hopefully that resonated with you and I want you to compare that to 4A, lecture 4A. I'll, I'll put a link in the, the notes so you can quickly go back to it if you're um, ahead instead. Sometimes you just go by the, the first one you see. So um, you can go back to 4A with that link that's in the notes. And 
really, the, the last one is just to look at the steps that are involved in uh, progress measurement and think about some of the steps that are involved in standard sort of uh, cost control progress me measurement. So um, we break it down into work breakdown structure components as we've discussed. We got to get the right level of detail as we discussed so that we can actually monitor it, not, not overly detailed that it takes more effort to actually insert the information than the value it provides, but not underly detailed uh, that we don't have enough detail that we can really see where the problems lie. Um, so that's what's important there. Uh, establish a standard unit of work. So I was kind of talking to that when I said planned work hour and then, you know, how many, how many blocks can we do in an hour? How many square meters of form work can we do in an hour? How many, um, how many cubic meters of concrete can we pour in an hour? If we have a standard measurement that we can measure against, that can be helpful for us too. So we can measure um, work hours against production and that gives us productivity. Uh, so that's a very helpful uh, measurement tool uh, when we uh, look at measuring progress and also understanding what's percent complete. Sometimes it's not as easy to tell. It does get easier when you broke it down fairly detailed because it's a little bit easier to tell. Like I was saying in previous lectures, you know, having one task and it's 120 days long and on day 20, where we're at, good luck. I don't know. Um, but uh, if you have it broken down to something, say 10 days or less, yeah, it's much easier to see. All right, so this is day five and physically we've got half the roof shingles on. So that makes sense that we're 50% uh, complete. Uh, so that can that can go that way. Sometimes you you got to look at it though too. Um, you could be 50% physically complete, but um, not hour wise. So for example, maybe the blocks that I was mentioning, uh, you're doing a gymnasium wall. Well, maybe the first seven feet of blocks or the first six feet of blocks you can do pretty much off the ground, uh, and you don't need any scaffolding. Uh, so that goes really, um, really quickly. But then now the next uh, six feet and the next six feet after that, you got to keep adding scaffolding and the scaffolding slows down your production rate. So that could mean that you look like you're way ahead with the blocks on the first third of the wall, but the second and the third uh, third of the wall takes more time because it there's more things to do with it. So you have to look at it, that perspective too. And that's where percent complete can be um, a little bit more complicated than it first appears. But the more accurate you are with that, again, the more uh, precise um, your uh, data is, then you can make better decisions. Experience can help with that a lot too. Um, so um, that's also the understanding. What's the, what's the means that you're going to use uh, in uh, determining what's uh, the progress in those particular activities? And we'll talk about that more in future um, lectures. Define who will measure. Well, somebody's got to be accountable for the actual measurement. And so making sure there's accountability there and that it's taking place, because if it's not taking place, then we don't have the data, then we don't know where we are and we're kind of lost, right? Uh, and um, have that understood before you start. Everything is easiest before you start. If you're setting up a project and you're about to um, start the project, to have an administrative process in place before you start, and then when you have a kickoff meeting, making sure that the protocols, everything is outlined, and that's the best way to um, progress. It's kind of like teaching in lots of ways. If you're teaching a large group, if you can sort of say, this is what we're doing, this is the way we're doing it, these are the marks, this is where you're going to get them from, this is when you're going to get them from, and keeping control of the group a certain way right from the beginning, it's much easier than doing things on the fly and people don't respond too well in construction, especially when people are giving you contracts and you're, they're signing off on contracts for a certain amount, they may have their own expectation of what that means. So if you're doing lean construction methodology and you expect them to be doing daily huddle meetings and you didn't discuss that and that's not part of their contract requirements, it's very difficult to do later on. So clarity and under, mutual agreement and understanding is very important. So those six steps um, uh, are kind of giving you that, that um, outline uh, for that. So we can measure um, project uh, process in a number of ways, and we'll get into this a little bit more too as we go along. Um, the units completed, blocks completed, 
uh, incremental milestones. How are we doing compared to um, the milestones that we set? Because those are those are energizing, motivating points that we can measure and they're points in time on the schedule and we can get better engagement with. And they're very clear when this is done or not done. So that's how you pick those milestones. Um, start and finish dates of activities broken down, uh, cost ratio uh, uh, based on you know productivity rates, uh, experience opinion, as I mentioned, that can be very helpful as well and weighted or equivalent units. So basically, as I was saying, some, some units may have to have a little bit more weighting on them because maybe it's the factoring of the execution of that particular unit. It's different if it's like uh, eight foot ceilings is different than 12 foot ceilings. There's a factoring that needs to go on if you're gonna be even hanging drywall, right? So uh, understanding um, those factors and making sure that we're uh, measuring appropriately with that. So that's just a quick outline that I wanted to go over on these um, particular points. And um, that's what I wanted to cover in 4B. So um, this uh, section's maybe a little bit uh, shorter than the previous uh, sections uh, that we did, but I think it, it's got a lot of value in it. So if there's something not clear, go back and check that part out. So this is Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day and keep working on the craft of project management and on the journey of getting better and better at what, what you do. It's a lifelong process. Bye for now.